You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm Pooh. And I'm William Cooper. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. goodness yeah well frank wishes <laughs> but uh no ma'am and uh, no sir not tonight here's really what, what we were trying to do Frank almost had your date there. <laughs> <laughs> I could use one, Bill. It's been an awfully long. <laughs> well, yeah, turn around and put your head on her shoulder, and we'll. <laughs> What's happening? Uh, same stuff is happening that we've been talking about. Uh, the market's going nowhere. Gold's continuing to be pressed down. Uh, we're down to 382.50. And we talked about what's doing that, and that's the Japanese uh, short selling. I really wish we could get a number on where they're hoping to get it to go, but you know, when you get right down to it, it's completely immaterial. If we remember back the last couple of years, we've seen the same thing happen with silver. Sell the market short, price comes down, they decide to take delivery, and then boom, it'll usually shoot up about a buck an ounce. Well, that's a significant move when you're talking about silver. With a paper counterfeit economy, it, it doesn't mean anything. Exactly. And and when this collapses, it's going to go through the roof. Exactly. And and it protects your assets. It'll buy the same thing it would 100 years ago and 200 years ago, and, and it always will 100 years from now. Exactly. And the biggest point out of that bill is what? People shouldn't bother to wait to get something done. They need to get it done. That's right. Especially after what you talked about last night. I've been telling people that, and I think you and I discussed it as well, uh, Basically, the power curve is changing. You know, what you do as far as the education and the rest of it, we are gaining strength. We are gaining momentum. They are losing momentum. We're at a point now where, you know, if you were to really sit down and think about it, we're probably 50-50 as far as it would be a coin toss as to who would win. As times progress, as we become more proficient, as we become, become more educated, as we gather more to our side and they start losing ground, they'll never get what they want. And by they, you know, obviously we're referring to the New World Order. So, yeah, uh, what you talked about last night is, is very fitting and, and highly, unfortunately, highly likely. Oh, I'm, I think it's a sure thing. Uh, there's, you, know, and you notice today they were showing us a picture of what on television? You know what? I didn't watch TV today. A truck axle. Oh, God, why am I? I was amazed that it didn't have writer written on it. I mean, they just stick to the party line right down the middle. Nothing ever changes. Uh, it's amazing. Now, as far as gold, uh, what we've got here, I've got the, one of uh, the numerous newsletters we get, Richard Russell's Dow Theory Letters. At $250 a year, it's cheap for the information you get from it. He goes on and on. He's been doing this newsletter since 1958. He's been studying the stock market longer than that. What to do, what to do. The most honest thing I can do is tell you what I personally have done. I've kept my gold coins, but I'm out of gold stocks. I've done this on the basis that anything can happen to any stock, but gold is gold, and I hold gold coins for different reasons than I hold gold stocks. Well, what you really mean is paper is paper and gold is gold. Exactly. But what, you know, the point is, you know, the biggest thing about Richard Russell is he's a mainstream type individual. He does technical analysis of the market. All right, he's not somebody who looks at the same things that we view. Uh, he'll watch the PPI and the CPI and, and all these other made-up numbers, and he still comes to the same conclusion that we've come to, that we don't, you don't want to be in paper right now. But the biggest thing, the best thing you can do is get as far away from paper as possible. And he goes on to the, one of the charts that he's come up with is one of his 
uh, friends and associates. Uh, it's called a buying, uh, Lowry study. What it is, it measures buying power versus values versus selling pressure. And he's making a basic prediction, the same prediction you've made, the same prediction I've made, and others that have studied the situation from our standpoint before the election. He feels that the market's going to have a serious problem before the election, which is... I think the election's going to have a serious problem happening. Well, yeah, you know, even if we get to that point, uh, you know, but well, let's quantify well, we'll that before November. <laughs> okay. Uh, given, uh, you know, all these things, you know, it's just proof. There's people out there, you know, you, know, you need to quit dilly-dallying. Uh, we've all got personal things in our lives that we're taking care of, but you got to get your future taken care of because if you don't get your future taken care of now, you're not going to have the time to do that, and that's a real simple matter. And there's some things that I'd really like to, to bring to people's attention outside of the gold thing, if I may. We've talked in the past about preparedness on, on different levels, and I was talking with a real good friend of mine today and, and the things that they discuss and the things that they train for. And I've covered two of those bases previously. Basically, when you're, you've got three levels of survival that you need to be thinking of, what you have in your pack, what you have on your person in your web gear, what you need to take it, you know, even further is what you have on you, period. Not, you know, just in your clothing. There's some things that you can do. There's some little things that would be very wise and very prudent to do. Uh, maybe have uh, some silk mats of your area made up and get them stitched like to the inside of your pants legs. So when you're, you know, if something wrong were to happen, you were picked up, you would at least have a map. You would know where you were going. Small compasses, real small, kind of like you'd almost find them in a Cracker Jack box. They're really uh, cheap, they're mostly for children, but they work. You stitch it somewhere in a pocket or on the inside of your pants near a button. So if somebody's patting you down, it's not noticed. Um, those are two things right there that can get you out of a bind if all presented with the opportunity if you find yourself in a bind. You need to make sure you have certain things in your clothing that will help you in that event. And given what you've outlined, the potential for civil war, there's something that people really need to consider. I mean, we figured this out out here in Arizona because we're a very hilly country out and around here. we got a lot of mountains and the rest of it down here in the Phoenix area. When you're shooting at targets and you've got more than a five-degree incline or decline, your bullets will start hitting high. The more serious the increase in uh, degree of angle, or the greater the distance, the greater the impact point above your point of aim, what you're normally uh, used to. There's a little uh, formula. If people are interested in, in getting this, I have a couple pages from a book that outlines this. There's a couple tables and the rest of it. They can send me a self-addressed stamp envelope at S. Swiss American. I'll, I'll just burn off. I'll make a photocopy for them and send these tables out. They're compiled for federal 168 grain 308 match, but it also has a little uh, uh, math program kind of here. You take if you know your drop inches, you uh, can compensate it through a, uh, a multiplication table that they have listed to determine your point of impact given certain criteria. So if you're on a in something, even with that big cannon you got, uh, your point of impact on that hill of yours is going to be significantly different when you're shooting down there because you got a pretty good elevation gain. And I'll get you one of these up if you'd like. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, and don't forget, you know, keep some stuff in your cars. You don't want to be caught short because you may be traveling. Something may go wrong when you're out and about. Make sure you've got the basics in your car. Some water, a little bit of food, you know, some shelter. You know, some of those these, these places uh, in this country, they still get cold at night. And keep your gas tank topped off. And I suggest the car you keep it in be an old car yes. with uh, the old distributor points and plugs and no computer chips or electronic ignition whatsoever. EMF or EMR, electromagnetic radiation, uh, and the rest of it, it will coast electronics. They can pulse that stuff. They've got handheld units that will pulse. Uh, well, of course, if you've read anything about Nikolai Tesla and some of the other things, and I know you have, the technology has been on for decades. Not me. Never heard of him. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Frank. I still. You have a good evening. Take care.
The number uh, to reach Frank is 1-800-289-2646. Ladies and gentlemen, give him a call. Get some real money in your hands. And stay tuned. Supporters of laissez-faire capitalism need to be aware of the linguistic sleight-of-hand attempts of collectivists, monopolists, and dedicated world socialists to confuse facts and ideological terms in the minds of the average individual. Let me use the following excerpt to illustrate my point. Quote, In what is widely accepted to be an increasingly interdependent global capitalist economy, the resurgence of nationalism poses an apparent contradiction. With its emphasis on social and cultural exclusion and its ambition of delimiting the territorial and sovereign limits of political authority, nationalism and, indeed, the nation-state would seem dysfunctional to the needs of of international capital, end quote. E.J. Hobbsbaum, 1975. First of all, within the context of global economy, or a global government, the term capitalist is a misnomer at best, and brazen deceit at worst. You see, if the international documents and treaties of the United Nations serve as any indication, the economic and private property restrictions they place upon the average individual are authoritarian and socialistic in the extreme. They would certainly prohibit the individual from freely engaging in entrepreneurial capitalist free enterprise while simultaneously protecting from unfair competition the small but entrenched coterie of pro-capitalist, which there is no such thing, global financial monopolists. I will not even attempt to address here the draconian restrictions these documents place upon freedom of thought, conscience, speech, and association. For contrary to the clever insinuations of Keynesian economists, monopolism is not capitalism any more than Nationalism is automatically the ideology of those demanding the conservation of distinct, politically sovereign nation-states. Monopolism is the protective merger of certain corporations with the state, thereby restricting or eliminating competition 
and eliminating the free choice of individual consumers to determine who shall provide them with goods and services. Monopolism, you see, is a manifestation of statist or globalist socialism. Monopolism is the very antithesis of free enterprise capitalism. And contrary to the equally deceptive insinuations regarding nationalism, those who would seek to preserve individual freedom and laissez-faire capitalism under a politically sovereign constitution and bill of rights designed to do just that are the true pro-freedom individualists. These heroes are frequently lambasted by the same press, academicians and economists who would deliberately confuse monopolism with capitalism. You see, constitutionalists, objectivists, libertarians, and other laissez-faire capitalists are incorrectly labeled nationalists, and nationalists anxious to redeem their vile ideologies with more virtuous associations do nothing to dispel the rumor. In fact, in the view of the true nationalist, the cure for international socialism is nothing more than fascistic authoritarian national socialism, usually racist, ethnocentric, tribalistic, and hierarchical, and bearing no resemblance whatsoever to libertarian concepts of limited government individualism, and pure capitalism. It is slander in the extreme to associate those who plead for politically sovereign nation-states in the name of pro-individualist, pro-capitalist freedom with those who espouse one of the most evil, pro-collectivist ideologies produced of political theorists, which is nationalism. Nationalism, ladies and gentlemen, accurately defined, does not encompass a patriotic devotion to pro-individualist, minimalist government or a free economy. Quite the contrary. Nationalism, or its complete appellation, national socialism, is the ideology of ethnic collectivism and economic protectionism overlaid with authoritarian state control of industry, property, and persons. It is closely allied to fascism, for which it usually serves as a preliminary political base, and populism, populism, yes, populism, an equally socialist politic which often precedes it. That's why you had better be damn careful if you're messing around with populism and the populist party and things like the Liberty Lobby. Nationalism, like its political fellow, populism, is completely antithetical to capitalism. You see, both Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini were nationalists. Both men nationalized industry, eliminated free market competition, and instituted economic protectionism. Thus, the belief in political national sovereignty in a pro-individualist, pro-capitalist state is to stand against the principles of national or global socialism. You see, such a state and its citizens will not gladly relinquish their protected freedoms to a globalist, mixed, read, socialist economy of international monopolism. In short, global economy? Sure. If it's capitalist. Global government? Never. Not on your life. International free trade is not nor ever has been the enemy of political sovereignty of nations. That is, of course, assuming such national governments actually protect personal and economic liberty. In fact, in such systems, the government does not restrict free trade of any kind, 
because the government in such systems does not interfere at all in the economic life of its citizenry. You see, this is the very meaning of laissez-faire. Therefore, the problem with GATT and NAFTA is twofold. The government of an economically free people has no business engineering the economic treaty of any kind. It is interference into the economic life of its people, which is redundant in view of already recognized constitutional freedoms to that effect. Individuals of any capitalist nation are assumed to be free as individuals to trade with any person or nation of their own choosing. Government-engineered trade tariffs represent an illicit attempt of government to assume an economic authority not granted by pro-individualist constitutions such as our own. Mandates such as these interfere in the economy and should never have been enacted in the first place. Such allegedly pro-capitalist treaties as GATT and NAFTA then represent nothing more than a curious political redundancy and an attempt at governmental economic engineering that would seem more nationalist in the socialist sense than capitalist. GATT and NAFTA would thus seem to bear closer examination. Why not simply pass national legislation repealing such anti-capitalist tariffs? Why the need for an anti-tariff treaty? The answers, ladies and gentlemen, are found in the bodies of the GATT and NAFTA agreements themselves. The answers are the political boners slipped into these documents by the international political and economic monopolists establishing a politically empowered international economic court to whose arbitrary rules the citizens of GATT and NAFTA nations fall subject. And far from establishing free trade, they actually impose international regulations on trade and manufacture. Yet these socialistic economic restrictions are passed off by international monopolists as promoting global capitalism. <laughs> First, though we must ask by what authority were our constitutionally protected individual rights and liberties signed over to this unaccountable international court, by the anti-constitutional assumed emergency powers authority claimed and exercised by every United States president since Franklin Delano Roosevelt. You see, this provision has enabled the presidents to usurp the lawmaking power of the Congress to unaccountably sign treaties with foreign powers, such as the United Nations, and to sign away our individual liberties under the guise of promoting free trade that should already have been assumed. Such totalitarian practices are insupportable and intolerable in a nation of free individuals. Again, free trade should be assumed without need of treaty in a nation of free individuals. Doesn't that make sense? Economic barriers erected by any government represent a system already moving into collectivism and away from freedom. So let us get down to basics. Assuming all intentions to be virtuous, the true purpose of legitimate, separate, and politically sovereign nation-states is not to ethnically or racially divide people of the world nor is it to imprison the inhabitants of any nation behind stone walls or barbed wire fences, nor is it to engineer or restrict economic activity in any manner. Such purposes are collectivist and philosophically insupportable. No, no, ladies and gentlemen, the only legitimate purpose of maintaining separate and sovereign nation-states is to politically protect the individual rights and freedoms of their geographical inhabitants and to prevent in the political arena what the Keynesians promote in the economic arena, which is monopolism.
It has only been by virtue of the existence of competing political entities that the people of the world have remained even marginally free. You see, such a balance of world political power has always provided something of a check to potential tyrants. The humiliation factor, not to mention the possibility of escape or lawful immigration of one's subjects to a distant shore, has often, though not always, served to curb the bloodthirstiest instincts of many a would-be dictator. And in that case, whatever in the world would be a sensible inducement for the citizens of a free nation to trade their national governmental system of pro-individualist and capitalist protections for the dubious governmental protections of a pro-collectivist, anti-capitalist global system. Folks, it is just too ridiculous to even consider. To label those supporters of political sovereignty as nationalists, thus virtually classifying them as totalitarian socialists, is to expose in all its resplendent human-hating evil the actual agenda of the global political monopolists who seek to confuse us. You see, language is what enables us to apprehend and comprehend reality itself. Therefore, whosoever can successfully obfuscate or alter the meaning of political and economic terms in the minds of the world's inhabitants can equally well redirect and control our very ideas. Ayn Rand, the great objectivist philosopher, correctly identified yet another semantic obfuscation that has corrupted the cleanliness of political debate. And I quote, from the intellectual bankruptcy of our age by Ayn Rand, copyright 1961. But what is significant, ominously significant, is the fact that certain groups are now attempting to switch the term conservative back to its 19th century meaning, to palm it off in the public by imperceptible degrees, never bringing the issue fully into the open, hoping that people will gradually come to believe that a conservative is an advocate of authority, but of traditional authority. If semantic corruption becomes accepted on that wide a scale, if the political switch pulled on us becomes a choice between 20th century status liberals and 19th century status conservatives, what political system will be silently obliterated by that switch? What political system is being destroyed by stealth without letting people discover that it is being destroyed? Capitalism. End quote. And now that these anti-capitalist elitists have removed our linguistic and philosophical ability to debate their twisted ideologies, now that they have exerted political pressure on the world's legislatures to all but outlaw entrepreneurial capitalist activities, they would yet seek to further consolidate their political power, leaving the genuine pro-capitalist dissidents with nowhere in the entire world to run. Truly, collectivism has served them well. Such political monopolism is the most ominous threat to capitalism, indeed to any advocacy of personal freedom. International government, the embodiment of political monopolism, is a virtual guarantee of totalitarian control of the world's people and complete eradication of pro-individualist, pro-reason, ethics, and politics. The sole moral justification for any system of government is strictly the protection of the unalienable natural freedoms and individual rights of each and every person subject to its laws. Such a system, ladies and gentlemen, can only exist in a world of politically distinct and sovereign nation-states. Any political system 
however, that violates the natural unalienable freedoms and rights of its citizens, instantly criminalizes itself and forfeits its legitimate claim to govern. And that was written in May 1996 by my good friend, Gene Faulkner. It will be an article in the forthcoming issue of Veritas, ladies and gentlemen. Don't go away. I think I've got to do a... Um, I state your name, do hereby pledge allegiance to the frat, do hereby pledge allegiance to the frat, uh, with liberty and fraternity for all. Amen. You may sit down. people get prepped for all these secret societies that are destroying us from within, just look at all of our colleges and all of the different fraternities on Fraternity Row and the supposed elitism that goes with being a member, pledging with Delta Chi, holding a key for Phi Beta Kappa, (laughs) or being awakened in the middle of the night at Yale University to be spirited away stripped of all your clothes to lie naked in a coffin with a string tied around your genitalia to be reborn with a new name in the crypt of the Russell Trust more commonly known as the Skull and Bones Dear Bill, as usual, these last three plus years, I was at a shortwave set at 11 p.m. local time. I do not keep pen and paper in hand because my mind would drift to electronic thoughts and the paper would soon be covered with radio electronic schematics. We all have our weaknesses and failings. The situation with Mr. Russo is most unfortunate. Yes, idea men are useful, but then idea men should be smart enough to find and place in charge a competent stick-with-it man. He did not do that with the Constitution Party, and we are all the losers. His current, quote, party, end quote, and $20 video may awaken a few in time, but I don't see it as being all that efficient. And faxes to our elected officials, a thousand faxes from one number is not as effective as ten letters from ten different addresses as a demonstration in opposition to the above $20 video please find and close my donation to your program of $20 one fourteenth of all I have please use it as you see fit thank you very much we will put it toward the printing of the upcoming book Oklahoma City Day One which ladies and gentlemen might be in your hands a lot sooner than any of us ever dreamed. If everything goes right, say a prayer. Because everything could go wrong. Just say a prayer. That's all we ask. Say a prayer for the book. Help it. Let me see here. I seem to be missing. Oh, here it is. It is with deep sadness that I find my opinion in agreement with yours. We will not be able to restore the Constitution without a long and bloody armed conflict. I do not arrive at this opinion, lightly or with any joy, I do not want to dip my Rambo knife into anyone's guts. I continue to be a 
conscientious tongue tied around I too. I continued to be a conscientious objector. Listen to this, folks. This is extremely interesting. I continued to be a conscientious objector. I was a Vietnam War resistor draft dodger. I, too, do not want to fight. But where do we draw the line? This is our country, my nation, my constitution. This will not be a war on foreign soil. This will be a civil war on my soil. The U.S. Constitution has been good for most of us, for most of the time, for over 200 years. For the Constitution, my conscience demands that I fight. I do still contend that we apply our efforts in the upcoming election, if and when it comes to a fight, the more people the Constitution has as its supporters in the Congress and the state houses, the better off we will be. We have to apply our efforts to electoral, electorally removing those who have acted as though the Constitution does not exist, removing those who have voted for laws in violation of the Second Amendment, and on removing those who voted for NAFTA and GATT in the face of massive opposition from their constituents, even as we work to gather the material and information to fight the upcoming war. Let me remind you that the people continued to ask for the right of Englishmen for over a year after the shooting started. If the shooting starts, we must continue to ask for the restoration of the Constitution, even as we fight for the restoration of the Constitution. The more people we have in government who are loyal to the Constitution, the better the chance of its restoration. Whoever wrote that fax letter that you read on the air tonight is a good wordsmith has his, her thoughts and ideas well thought out, and all facts in order. Hang on to whoever it is, and we certainly will. At the close of your program, WWCR still playing the tape with old address, the part. The post office may be slow to forward per your change of address order, mail from the old Sholo P.O. box, and may place your orders in the inactive file as soon as as allowed, or perhaps before allowed. It would be a great idea to apply yourself to quickly changing that closing tape to one that carries the new mailing address, and you're absolutely correct. My problem is is that I can't hear it, and so I quickly forget about it, and uh, <laughs> I will try very hard to do that tomorrow. On this date, the Freeman surrendered to arrest by the FBI. What of the legal brief given by the Freeman? And that's a good question to the Justice Department for a ruling and publication claiming that they would surrender afterwards. I have heard nothing more. The Justice Department may have found its hands conveniently tied. In the federal court system, all legal deliberation stops when one jumps bail, escapes, or fails to submit to arrest. Now be, may be the time to press the Justice Department for its ruling and publication. Keep up the good work. Take care. Sincerely. Yours, Oscar. Thank you, Oscar. And I don't know what happened to it. I sincerely don't. I haven't heard any more about it either. Land transfer vital to future of Fort Polk and Vernon Parish. The proposed transfer of Kitsachi National Forest land to the Army for expansion of the training area at Fort Polk is vital to the continued success of the Joint Readiness Training Center. As a concerned businessman, citizen, and neighbor to Fort Polk, I find it necessary to speak up about the misleading, misdirected messages being delivered to the citizens of central Louisiana. In 1995, as president of the Greater Vernon Chamber of Commerce, our program of work included the project addressing Fort Polk's need for more training land. Our goal was to simply encourage and support this need. As a chamber, we felt that providing this land to Fort Polk would be one more way our community could say to the world and to Congress, Vernon Parish folks love Fort Polk and the JRTC. But even beyond this, we saw the need for Fort Polk to have more training land. You see, these are the businessmen down there who have sold out for money. They want the United States Army to be training foreign troops on this soil to become UN peacekeepers, 
peacekeepers in the United States of America and in other countries so that they can make a short-term dollar from those people. And I'll bet you anything that the author of that letter, ladies and gentlemen, was a Freemason, especially if he was the head of the Chamber of Commerce. And this is from the American Press, Sunday, June 9, 1996. And uh, from Worcester, Massachusetts, Telegram and Gazette, Thursday, June 13, 1996. Washington, driving home to Austin, Texas after a football game, Mary Boyd saw a car veer off the dark highway and crash. She called 911 from her cellular phone, but the call was of little help to rescuers because Boyd didn't know precisely where she was. In the next few years, that problem would be resolved under a plan adopted yesterday by federal regulators requiring cellular companies to upgrade their networks with technology to locate a 911 caller, which means they could locate any caller. The Federal Communications Commission adopted the plan on a four-to-nothing vote. In other words, it's going to become reality. So watch for it, ladies and gentlemen. And remember, from now on, at some point in the future, when you use your cellular phone, somebody will know exactly where you are every moment. And uh, in Worcester, Massachusetts, Telegram and Gazette, Wednesday, June 19, 1996, they are trying to push through a gun bill that has been criticized as being too weak. So it's been put back in committee to be beefed up. And if you live in Massachusetts, you'd better organize and oppose it. Video Cop, also from the Telegram and Gazette, Saturday, June 22nd, 1996. In Massachusetts, they want to put surveillance monitors at all intersections. One of the persistent irritants and occasional hazards of living in Massachusetts is the notoriously bad driving habits of many of its motorists. They want, ladies and gentlemen, television cameras at every intersection, and they're already at every intersection in many cities around the country. Here's another one. Video monitoring gets yellow light. The city has moved a step closer to having video cameras set up at some of its more dangerous intersections to catch people who run red lights. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Let me see. I want that one. Where am I? Another one. Video cop never blinks. Bill seeks intersection cameras. Another one, Clinton suggests curfews for youths in nation cities. You see how the federal government is trying to reach into every single segment of our lives? Can you believe this? Can you believe it? Clinton suggests curfews for youths in nation cities. The federal government wants to institute federal curfews for youths all across the country. And... Uh, they're putting out federal guidelines to do it with. There's another letter. Dear Mr. Cooper, in the past year I've become increasingly appreciative of your position on national issues and events. I resigned my leadership position in uh, United We Stand America. And I'm not going to read the district because I don't want to give this person's identification away. I don't... Uh, Nope, he did not give me permission to do that, so I won't. I resigned my leadership position in United We Stand America. Blankety blank congressional district coordinator and board member in United We Stand America, and I'm not going to say the state. The charade ended about a year and a half ago when I cornered Russell Verney in a meeting, just as you did one Aaron Russo, and asked him a series of questions regarding the Council on Foreign Relations Trilateral Commission and the New World Order. The United We Stand America board members, with whom I was very familiar throughout the state, had held our own private meetings after the official policy meeting and discussed the status quo. It came as no surprise to me when Russell Verney, Perot's point man, 
would not touch any of the subjects with a ten-foot pole. And those of us that were at the meeting pulled the plug by contacting the others who either withdrew or resigned. We had found the Trojan horse who had been working both ends against the middle to further his computer sales as shown in the DeBolt report. He was shown to have a dedicated purpose in implementing Hillary Clinton's health care scheme worldwide through the New World Order. The demise of United We Stand America in this state, and I'm not going to mention the name of the state, left me with an unresolved plan of action and a small group of ex-Marines turned me on to your programming on WWCR. Later found a more satisfactory solution on C-Band, and tonight was the best audio quality I've experienced on 14 in a long time. I am well aware that nearing the election is also nearing critical mass and that unity is of the essence for the time is short. As in United We Stand America open meetings, we've had our share of infiltrators and matoids who disrupt with intent to destroy. We've seen the same in our small select group of about five and we've had to replace a few with men whom we could trust. Controlling the list is a big job. Even though it appeared to me that you were treating some a little rough at first, in time, your wisdom became apparent, and your action I found appropriate. On Thursday's program, from my perspective, I thought you handled Aaron Russo very gently and really were almost polite when you dismissed him. Moreover, you did good. You drew him out like a professional, and although it may have taken an entire program, we became the beneficiaries in receiving the background of the Constitution Party and the rationale for its demise and who was responsible. You may have thought you wasted your program time and your patience, but we reaped the benefit as the proceedings kept us on the edge of our chairs as we learned who, what, and why. I have come to appreciate your list, rules and all. It's talking about the Internet list, folks, which is very strict. <laughs> very strict. Anybody steps out of line incurs my wrath, including... All of the language that I ever learned in the United States Navy, when and if it's necessary. I just don't have the patience for ninnies anymore, folks. I have come to appreciate your list, rules and all, and continuing would be an advantage to me, and I agree that it is a two-way street. In addition, since I believe that yours is the only honorable game left in town, and one that exercises good sense before action, I would like to join your effort in any way that I can, either through my experience, expertise, either through my expertise in microwave and satellite electronics, or in any other assignment germane to a unified effort. I am retired ex-military, I'm not going to say the name of the organization, and have never been involved in masonry or any other subversive organization of any kind, and I love my country. My only affiliation is Toastmasters. At one time I filed a short resume when you made and on the air request, I'd like to help and would take any assignment within my capabilities to perform and perhaps might tackle a greater challenge. Sincerely, yours, Geo. And, uh, by golly, I've just got so many things here, and I want to try to get down to some nitty gritty here before the hour creeps up on me. Oh, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, you can purchase this book. It is published by the Brookings Institute. The Brookings Institute. Henry Brandon is the editor. Henry Brandon is the editor. It's entitled, The Future of U.S.-European Relations in Search of a New World Order. <laughs> they keep telling us there's no new world order, and we keep finding all of the proof in their own words that there really is a new world order. <laughs> Oh, it is amazing. You can purchase this book, folks. You can find it. It may even be in your library. Published by the Brookings Institute. Henry Brandon, editor. The Future of U.S.-European Relations. And the title is In Search of a New World Order. <coughs> Just want to give you that. There's another book entitled Hitler's Willing Executioners. Hitler's Willing Executioners. Ordinary Germans and the Holocaust by Daniel uh, Jonah Goldhagen, Alfred A. Knopf. The ISBN is 0-679-44695-8. 
And uh, he concludes that anti-Semitism was integral to the beliefs of ordinary Germans, so deeply embedded in their thinking that they often were willing to kill Jews when they would not have been penalized for refusing to do so. And you could substitute Jews for any other people. What it really means is that the authoritarian control gives you the permission to do something to any group of people who do not look like you, think like you, talk like you, or act like you. The tendency for the average person is to do it. You can also purchase this book, ladies and gentlemen. This will knock you. <laughs> edited by Colin H. Williams. Edited by Colin H. Williams. This is called The Political Geography of the New World Order. Remember they keep telling us this New World Order does not exist? The Political Geography of the New World Order. It's a book edited by Colin H. Williams. Bellhaven Press, a division of Pinter Publishers Limited, 25 Floral Street, Covent Garden, London, WC2E9DS, United Kingdom. First published in Great Britain in 1993. But, but, but there's no New World Order. I mean, everybody keeps telling me this. There's no New World Order. Ho, 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 ho. Just keep believing that. Here's another one. Here's another one, ladies and gentlemen, published by the World Federalist Association, 418 7th Street Southeast, Washington, D.C., 20003. And here's the name of the book, A New World Order. Can it bring security to the world's people? Essays on Restructuring the United Nations. The first sentence in the introduction says, President Bush brought the term back into current usage. Now listen to me. Listen to this. President Bush brought the term back into current usage at the outset of the war in the Gulf. But the concept of a new world order is an old one, just like I've been telling you for years. Here is their own admission. Now listen to this. Remember what I've been telling you about the millennium fever? Those who believe in prophecy are going to bring this about, even though it's going to hurt them the worst. Listen. From their beginning in 1947, world federalists have distinguished themselves from the rest of the peace and justice movement by insisting that the millennial vision in phrases like new world order can only be realized through governmental structures. And it goes on to talk about the millennial vision, talks about the millennial fever, talks about a window that will be open for a short period of time. Get my drift, y'all. Ah, here's another one. You ever hear of Senator Paul Simon, Democrat, Illinois? Senator Simon speaks out for U.S. leadership in supporting the United Nations. And in the World Federalist, the quarterly newsletter for the World Federalist Association, April 1996, supports the formation of a new world order. Here's something. A quote from Ayn Rand. We cannot fight against anything unless we fight for something. And what we must fight for is the supremacy of reason and a view of man as a rational being. I agree wholeheartedly. I'm tired of rumors and bullshit and lies and wacko theology and all of this. If it feels good, do it crap. And my, my spirit guides told me to do it. That's the same as the devil made me do it, in my estimation. The terms liberal and conservative are two of the emptiest sounds in today's political vocabulary. They have become rubber words that can be stretched to fit any meaning anyone cares to give them. What is it that the terms liberal and conservative have now come to hide? <laughs> Originally, folks, the term liberal meant an advocate of individual rights, of political freedom, 
of laissez-faire capitalism and an opponent of the authoritarian state, while the term conservative meant an advocate of the state's authority, of tradition, of the established political order, of the status quo, and an opponent of individual rights. It has been observed many times that the term liberal today means the opposite of its 19th century meaning and means almost exactly today what conservative used to mean and still does for the most part. Most of you who say you're conservative, you have no idea what you're talking about. Most of you who say you're liberal, you don't have any idea what you're talking about either. You're using buzzwords, the meaning of which you have ceased to understand many, many years ago. You are just pawns in a big game that you don't even understand. You don't even know what square you're standing on. You don't even know you're in danger of being knocked right off the board. You can also purchase this book, ladies and gentlemen. Published by the Council on Foreign Relations. It is a Council on Foreign Relations book. Listen to this. Most of the people who run the government are members of the Council on Foreign Relations. And they tell you there's no New World Order. They're lying to you. The name of this book is The Imperial Temptation. The New World Order. And America's purpose. Sounds like several titles of the hour of the time, doesn't it? <laughs> Copyright 1992 by the Council on Foreign Relations. In the contents, part one, America's road to the new world order. The Bush administration and the end of containment. Two, the new world order. Three, aggression and collective security. Four, visions of order past and present. They do an autopsy on the Gulf War. Part three, American security and the national purpose. <laughs> Renovation is the last chapter. No new world order? Bullshit. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. And... God bless each and every single one of you, lost though you may be. The night was clear and the moon was yellow and the leaves came tumbling down. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, Ari Shavit, a prominent Israeli journalist and columnist, has admitted in the Israeli newspaper Haratz that Israel controls the White House, the Senate, and most of America's media.